This is part one of growing great warm season vegetables. In this section, we'll be talking about a quick review on soils and what you can do in the spring to get your soils up and ready if you haven't already done that last fall. And we'll be talking about the 17 plus two must have herbs in your garden. Well, there you have it, a little history. Well, now on to spring soil amendments for 4x8 raised bed gardens. And you do this if you did not amend your soils last fall. First, I would add 3 to 2 cubic feet bags of composted cotton burrs. They're available at most of your independent garden shops in town. Then you want to add some organics. Now this will add the nutrients to your soil. The cotton burr breaks up your soil and makes it friable or crumbly, but the organics will help add, these fertilizers will help add some nutrients. Now there's many great ones on the market, and you add three to four cups of that. Espoma Garden Tone is one, Yum Yum Mix, Happy Frog, Down to Earth, All Purpose, and there are many on the market. Also, it is important to add some extra minerals to your soil. Azomite is a great addition, and it has over 70 minerals and many trace minerals in it that will help give that added goodness to your soil that your plants will need. Now this is an important one that many gardeners forget, but a little bit of sugar in your, in your garden is a good idea. Two cups of dry molasses or cane sugar, and we use organic cane sugar, dusted into your garden is a very good thing. It'll help the bacteria and the fungi grow. That will break down much of the organic material for the plants and that'll help make it available, the nutrients available to your plants. Now you want to work that down 12 to 8 inches into the soil, 12 to 18 inches into the soil. Get that all done. Now this last is done later in the season, after you've planted. This is mycorrhizal fungi, and you dust the top of your soil and work around your plants and apply this after you have planted in the spring, and that'll help bring nutrients to your plants. Now one important thing that we have done last fall was we added mulch to our garden. And I want you to see what happens when we take a peek underneath the straw mulch in the springtime and see what we find. You can see here there's a lot of earthworms. And again, if you could see this, there would be many other uh, mi macro and micro uh, organisms in the soil that were kept alive and healthy with that mulch just to prevent the soil from drying out in the harsh winter. Uh, conditions. And there's some more earthworms in a shovel full. Now let's get on to the wonderful world of herbs. And yes, they're important in your garden, and we plant them throughout our garden, and we put them in our garden beds and around our garden as well, for a lot of reasons. And we'll, let's just see a few here. And these are the 17 plus 2, and the plus 2 you'll see uh, later on in this presentation why I put that like that. And these are what I call must-have herbs in the garden. One is bergamot, bee balm, marnarda. Um, it attracts pollinators. It uh, is used in um, pot puree. Um, it's aromatherapy. It's in the mint family. Very fragrant, but it's a great addition. Some people have actually used it as a tea. Catnip also is another one. When it flowers, it attracts pollinators, as you can see here. There you can see a honeybee on the flower. And of course, it can be used in herbal teas, mint family, and of course, to tease your cats if you have any. We like the Genovese basil variety, but it's, there's many varieties of basil on the, on the market that you can grow. Of course, it's culinary, and if you let it go to flower, it will attract pollinators, as you can see here. And if you plant it next to tomatoes, they say that it helps your tomatoes grow a little better, and it also is in the mint family. French tarragon is one that we don't see too often in, in uh, gardens here in the United States, but it is an excellent herb. It has a mild anise flavor used in culinary, and once you start using it, you'll find out that there's many, many uses for tarragon in your cooking. 
English thyme attracts pollinators, but it's a culinary herb as well. And when it flowers in the spring, you can see the bees will just uh, enjoy the extra pollen and nectar that they get out of English thyme. Now number seven on our list is parsley, both curled and flat leaf. The top picture shows flat leaf up top and curled leaf. And these two parsleys uh, attract black swallowtail butterflies. And the reason they do is they lay their eggs there and they hatch out into the caterpillar, of course. And the caterpillar will eat some of your parsley, uh, but we let that go because we just so much enjoy the black swallowtail. Now the top picture of the caterpillar shows two antenna poking, poking out, orange, yellow antenna. And it will exude an, an, a, a smell, an odor, that is supposed to protect it when something like a bird tries to eat it. And if you do poke one of these, you will see and it'll uh, probably squirt on your hands and it'll leave a little odor. Now, these, uh, the parsley and the, the, uh, the parsley does attract syrphid flies, which are called hover flies. And you can see in the lower photo, they're in the diptera order of insects, which means that they only have two wings. And you can see that they're hover flies because they hover around the flower just like you would see hummingbirds flowering around a flower, hovering around a flower. And they help eat aphids, thrips, and other small insects. Very beneficial. Now cilantro produces coriander seed, um, and it is culinary as a leaf, and of course the seed is also culinary. And when it flowers, it does attract pollinators and also that seraphid fly, which is also good for uh, eating some of the harmful insects that might come into your garden. Now, if you're going to harvest coriander seed, let it flower, go to seed, and let those seeds turn brown. And when they've turned thoroughly brown, then collect them and you can store them inside and use them for later cooking. Now, dill is another one closely related to all of these that you've seen. Um, and dill is used for culinary reasons, of course, and it does attract pollinators up to the small flowers and that same fly, that seraphid or hover fly, which is so beneficial as we have seen. Now making number 10 on our list is chives. It is culinary and it also attracts pollinators. You can see a honeybee right here. And in the lower photo, you can see the flowers of the chives just beginning to open up. And chives is an excellent addition to the garden. Of course, many people enjoy chives cut up into uh, many, many dishes. Garlic chives is a, a relative of the chive plant, obviously, and in the onion family. And when it flowers, it is an excellent attractor of honeybees and bumblebees and, uh, and even butterflies. And uh, one thing about the, the garlic chive, though, however, is after it flowers and the flowers die back, it'll produce a lot of seeds. And if they drop down into your garden, you will then get a lot of small garlic chives growing up at the end of the season or even into next year. So if you don't want that, after the flowers have died back and just before the seeds are formed, then trim off the flowers. And making number 12 is sage. It's also in the mint family. And of course, it can be used in culinary, uh, for culinary uses. And when it does flower, it will attract pollinators. And it is a beautiful lavender uh, purple flower, light purple flower, just, uh, just marvelous. And of course, mints uh, of all kinds uh, used in culinary attracts pollinators and uh, you know, used in many dishes. Now here uh, up top are two uh, photographs of mints. Now, do you know the difference between spearmint and peppermint, which one is which? Yes, I think many of you probably have, have recognized this. The one on the left is spearmint with the green stem. The one on the right is peppermint with the reddish stem. All mints, as you can see in the lower photo, have a square stem. And that's how you recognize plants of the mint family. Rosemary is another one that is a delightful addition to gardens, of course, culinary. And when it does flower, it does attract pollinators. And again, you know, like I said, it's in the mint family. Um, there are two varieties of rosemary that we like. One is called Tuscan Blue. It's got a, it's, it's got a wonderful flavor and aroma to it. I like it best. However, it doesn't last through our, our winters here in the Pikes Peak regions without uh, a considerable amount of protection. 
But there is another variety called ARP, A-R-P, that does survive our winters. Um, the taste is good, flavor and aroma is good, but my favorite is still Tuscan Blue, and we dig it up from the garden and uh, bring it into our greenhouse. Or what you can do is take some cuttings off of it, just put it in a glass of water um, next to your windowsill. It will root in a couple weeks, and then you can pot it up and you'll have a small rosemary plant to plant out again come next spring. Lavender is in the mint family too, and it has culinary uses and of course as a perfume. I mean, it's, it's just a, it has a wonderful aroma and uh, the pollinators are attracted to the lavender as well. Now there are a lot of types of fennel, but this one is called Florence fennel, which bulbs up as you can see the white, actually that's a stem that's above the ground, and that is really what you use in many cooked dishes. Um, but you have to make sure not all fennels will bulb up like that, but the Florence fennel will. And that's the one uh, that we enjoy so much in cooking. German camel meal can easily be grown from seed dusted into your garden. The one we like, of course, is the German. There are other varieties like Roman. I don't like the Roman as well. I don't think it has that, uh, that good a flavor for me. But it can be used the same way as German. Now notice that the German camel meal has uh, now uh, a different species name, Matricaria camomilia. It used to be called Matricaria recutita, uh, but either way, German camel meal is a wonderful addition, makes herb teas, it attracts very small pollinators. Now, if you collect the, the flowers for tea, do so at the stage that you see above, and you need to dry it, but when you do, make sure that the temperature in your dehydrator does not exceed 105 degrees. So between 100 and 105 is the correct temperature to dry German camel meal. A little cooler temperature is even better, but uh, you'll have to dry it for a little longer. And then you store it in a glass jar and seal it and use it later for teas. Now these are the last two, and the reason the plus two is because they need to be grown indoors. One is aloe vera. You know, we all know it as the burn plant. It's when you get a burn, you rub that uh, gel from the leaf um, onto the burn, and it's very helpful can also be used for dry chapped hands as well. Um, it's a good plant to have. doesn't survive our winters and in our intense sun it tends to uh, discolor and turn a little uh, reddish color from the stress of our intense sun here. But it does grow well in the summer here but bring it indoors uh, before the first frost. Another one is the bay laurel and this is where you get bay leaves and it's a tree and it grows big. But you can buy it from nurseries at the picture on the left hand side and you can see that. And you can buy it as a small tree, keep it potted up. Um, I have the one on the, on the right hand side shows a bay laurel that I planted uh, and it grows inside my greenhouse. And uh, we get all the bay leaves that we want from that. Um, just a delightful addition, I think. Well, that's it for part one. So please stay tuned and check in for part two for more on warm season vegetables.